Gar Alpowitz has been a leader in the new economy movement for many years. He is a political historian, a professor at the University of Maryland, and a co-founder of the Democracy Collabor Collaborative. He gives an overview of the new economy better than anybody else, and it also includes examples of the on-the-ground initiatives that are, have huge potential for systemic change. He notes a cautious sense of optimism here, but after I heard him, I have to tell you, I have a whole lot more hope for where our economy can go and will go in the future. Bon appetit. <laughs> what comes to mind, it's very hot in Washington right now. It's a good time for very, very cold beet borscht. Big questions. Um, most people are rightly engaged in community projects right now. That There are growing numbers, extraordinary change in the last three years of, of worker-owned co-ops and interest in co-ops, for instance, um, which is democratic ownership through worker ownership. There are hundreds of land trusts, which is neighborhood ownership, but democratizing. Um, some cities, uh, Boulder, Colorado, just municipalized through city ownership its electric utility. Uh, there are 20 states looking at state-owned banks, like the Bank of North Dakota. Legislation has been posed. Um, so if you look around, there are 140 million people involved in, in one or another form of co-op, some of them historical. Um, Credit unions, this kind of garden variety credit union, is a democratic bank, one person, one vote. And if you take them all together, you have a trillion dollars in assets, as much as really many of the big New York banks. So the, the emergent at the, at the local level, primarily, of lots and lots of experiments, uh, many of them green, many of them democratizing wealth, uh, is building up, I think, a, a group of people who are learning new principles. Uh, Power comes from capital in, in capitalism, or power comes from ownership of capital in, in state socialism. Uh, if you want to change the system, we've got to democratize wealth. And if you want to do it in a way that's democratic, you start at the bottom, community by community by community. And what's exciting about this period, uh, largely out of pain, people are actually beginning to do that and, and understand it's important. But that's not changing the system. That's laying groundwork. And most people sense that, you know, projects take you so far. And one way I think about it is in the, in the prehistory of the New Deal, the 30 years before the New Deal. And if you want to change the system, you're talking 30 years, time horizons. And I often say, those are the, you want to play this game, they'll put 10 chips on the table and they're chips of your life, decades. In the period before the New Deal, 20 years or 30 years, there was experimentation at the state and local, they called it the laboratories of democracy. But when the right time came, the same principles that had been tested and refined and played with became principles that could be extended to national level or regional level. So, for instance, you've got labor law in that case, which was experimented with a couple of states. Uh, labor legislation, union legislation, what became uh, social security. All that was experimented with first and then transferred to much larger level. So uh, what I think of over time is that people are learning and developing. You really have to learn this stuff. We don't know how to do it, and, and there's no shortcuts. But beginning to think about what do we do about those big banks? Uh, at some point, virtually every expert we know says they're going to be another banking crisis. They'll go down, we'll have a big crisis. The current proposal amongst liberals, and it's, you know, it's a positive proposal, is when that happens, break them up into littler banks. We know for sure from history what will happen is the big fish will eat the little fish and they'll be back at the same level. You literally can't regulate them. Uh, you know, the, the conservative economists at the Chicago School of Economics, very conservative place of all, of all people, uh, they figured this out. They said, you know, they wanted a free market economy and the big corporations were not, they were rigging the markets in one form or another, de facto. So they said, if you try to regulate them, they will take over the regulators. That's a conservative argument. Milton Friedman's teacher was making that argument. Many others were too. And they said, if you try to break them up, the big fish will eat the little fish. And the only thing left is to turn them into a public utility, nationalizing them. So I think that's kind of direction for some of the big ones. 
uh, down the line will build on what's happening in local credit unions, democratic ownership, state banks like the Bank of North Dakota has been there 100 years, which is a state-owned bank. And we're learning how you would, in fact, nationalize some of the really big players that you, when you really have to, so they would be in service of a different community-based vision. Um, so that's the way I think about it. In, in the New Deal, another element, people forget about it, but it's very important, is that the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is a very large, socialized, public-owned utility, one of the largest in the country, which also ran, manages the river system ecologically, used to flood all the time. So it's an ecologically oriented public institution. That, that institution in its original design was community-based. World War II and the corporations took it over, but particularly World War II and became what it now is, which is a bastardized version of what it once hoped to be. But thinking about it that way, that actually building up these models is necessary to do as much as you can at the local level. That's ground zero because you build democratic practice. But if you don't actually address the system problem, the syst if, you, if you don't deal with the system, the system will deal with you ultimately. And most people know that. Most people know that it's a systemic problem. So it's really incumbent upon us to go beyond projects. What does it look like? What do you really want? And how do we build up both a vision that is beyond a vision, kind of a sense of concretely. Vision is about values. But concretely, what would it look like? What kind of system is it we were talking about that would actually produce real democracy, real ecological sustainability, uh, break down the power structures that, that, that violate human individual liberty, uh, actually generate a context at the local level that would build a, a culture of community, of people caring for each other. Uh, now, how, how do we address that and begin to say that's where we need to go? We're going to have to think through and talk to each other and do research and begin to open up uh, how do you build from one step to the next step and then what does it look like over time? The Evergreen model is not only worker or multi-stakeholder co-ops uh, doing really significant things. So one of the largest urban uh, greenhouses in the country are capable of producing three million heads of lettuce a year is one of them, and another is a large industrial scale laundry, and then another one, significant scale, solar installation company, and they hope to build more and more. Those are all structured as freestanding worker co-ops or worker, worker multi-stakeholder efforts. But unlike just worker-owned co-ops, which in a market economy are forced to compete with each other, it's a really important point because I'm a supporter of worker-owned co-ops, but we know that in a worker-owned co economy, they're forced to compete. In the Evergreen model, they are linked together with a nonprofit corporation, which is a community-building corporation. Some of the profits go to the community, some of them go to start new worker-owned companies in a complex that has a much broader purpose. It's the community as a whole that we're trying to build out for. So that's, that's one, one distinction, and you could apply that at a larger scale to cities more broadly. We'll come back to that. But also, it's in part supported by the purchasing power of institutions that are significantly public. So universities and hospitals particularly have a lot of public money in them. Uh, Case Western Reserve, Cleveland Clinic, University Hospital in that particular very poor neighborhood, very poor, 40,000 people, maybe 40% unemployment, family income, 21,000, very poor, mostly black. Right in the middle of them are these big institutions with huge amounts of money. They buy three billion, with a B, not an M, in goods and services a year, leaving aside their salaries and leaving aside construction. That's what they buy, and a lot of public money. So part of the model is to try to turn some of that purchasing into purchasing from companies, worker-owned companies, in this complex that will build the community at the same time they, they help the workers in the area. So it's a planning model if you think about it. We don't particularly see that word very often, but it's an attempt to use these public and quasi-public resources to help stabilize and then rebuild the community rather than uh, either worker-owned co-op or you know an entrepreneur who makes some money and then run to the suburbs. This is a community building strategy and not simply oriented even to just ownership. So that's the model in Cleveland, but if you think about it in larger scale, 
uh, you know, we just, General Motors and Chrysler both were nationalized because there was a national crisis, huge amount of taxpayer money. You could think of them at some point making mass transit vehicles and high speed rail and with public money and with commuter money and with passenger money, why not use that to target jobs? Why not target jobs back to Detroit? Instead of letting the auto companies run out, stranding the city, you could actually use the, the model that we've got in Cleveland writ large and begin to stabilize parts of cities like Detroit. And that would be intelligent. It would be, uh, I'm an economist, that would be extremely economic very inefficient from the point of view of the national economy. You're literally throwing away cities, housing, hospitals, roads, schools, etc. when you throw a million people out of Detroit. And we think if you look at models like this little model in Evergreen, you get some principles that might say, later on down the line, let's build towards using an economic way to do this would be to stabilize Detroit to build mass transit vehicles. It would have ecological implications, it would have human implications, but it would save money as well because you're not having to pay to throw away these costs that appear on somebody else's balance sheet. Uh, and usually the costs appear on human balance sheets. They, they lose their house. Huge cost. Or the school is a bad school, so the kids don't get educated because the school's so bad. Those costs don't appear on anybody's balance sheet except personal, and yet they're very big public costs. I'm a you know, historian and a political economist, so um, I'm cautious about these things, but I'm also not knee-jerk pessimistic, you know. Um, the Berlin Wall collapsed, unexpected. The Soviet Union collapsed, unexpected. Apartheid system collapsed, unexpected. A bunch of farmers and, you know, small businessmen in the 18th century defeated the Brit British Empire, the most powerful empire in the world, unexpected. So the women's movement came out of nowhere, radically shifted consciousness. So. I'm cautious about predictions that people, because they look at the moment when people are very pessimistic about the current state of affairs in Washington, uh, I'm cautious about what that means. We shall see. There's a lot of pain in the country. There's a lot of people stirring. Um, there's a lot of determination. It would not be unusual if people built up the prehistory of the next big positive explosion or the next big American revolution or the next big progressive era. And I certainly think that's what we should strive for, I th laying the groundwork for something much larger and getting serious about it. But if you don't have that kind of vision of where you're going, you'll never get there. So I, I think it's time to be uh, cool about being conscious of what is possible historically, Con conscious also about the difficulties. But pessimism is pretty easy because we, you know, we all have a vested interest in pessimism. You don't have to do anything if nothing's going to work. So uh, we need to challenge ourselves at that level. I'm cautious about reading current pessimism as the inevitable reality forever. And uh, I think people uh, need to think, think a little bit more historically about how the great pain that's building up, and there is a lot of pain building up, um, may go on forever. It's possible that nothing will ever change. It's more likely that the pain is going to cause people to begin doing things and making demands and being organizing and beginning to get active. That's more likely. And then the question is active in, the, is it a direction that we've actually thought through and begun to develop practical realities and experiments that point somewhere? So I think uh, it's a really important time in history where developing real knowledge, not, not theory, practical stuff on the ground but also seeing it as potentially opening much bigger vistas for larger principles and talking to each other about it instead of saying, well, you know, nothing can be done or we'll see lots, you know, all over the country you're seeing replications or attempts to do things like the project in Cleveland. Uh, I think we've had uh, about 100 inquiries from cities to do that. But if you look on the ground and we do a lot of research on this, at the Democracy Collaborative, there's an explosion of stuff going on at the level that we're talking about in every part of the country. Uh, Jackson, Mississippi has got a big explosion. There was a big meeting very recently there, at Jackson Rising. Uh, all in the West, you see it in Richmond, California, is using eminent domain, which is local nationalization to challenge the banks. The power to, of eminent domain is city nationalization, if you like, municipalization. We talked about Boulder. So if you actually look at what's happening on the ground, there's an explosion of stuff that's not being covered in the press. Uh, and then to a certain degree, that's probably a good idea because we need to learn more and develop more. 
But in terms of activists and people who care about the future, uh, people not being knowledgeable and aware don't, don't realize how much company they have if they begin to do something and what they could learn. But now if you want to do it, there's a lot of people doing it and you can find expertise to help you. So on the ground is one part. The other part is how do we start a, um, it has two parts, how do we start a really informed non-rhetorical discussion nation nationwide about how do we change the system? If you don't like corporate capitalism, you don't like state socialism, what is the model? And how do we, how do we open a thoughtful, intelligent, serious debate on that question? I mean, it's not beyond human possibility. So the project is to try to launch a big national dialogue. Um, we've got the president of the, of the last year's president of the American Political Science Association agreeing that we face a systemic problem, time to have a debate about it. We had a big meeting at Harvard recently. President of the Sociological Association also saying we face a system problem, time to have a national discussion of what does that mean, how do we go forward. And more interesting, the president of the Academy of Management, 29,000 business school professors around the world. Same question, we've got to discuss the system. So we're trying to say, okay, what does it look like? And can we get a lot of, can we get some graduate students to say how, what's the best way to design a banking system? How do we actually get serious about the, you know, we have a constitution, 18th century rickety constitution designed to keep power in the hands of the people who were designed it, um, in obvious stalemate. What do we think about the political system over time? How do we actually get intelligent about it rather than rhetorical? And that's, a, that's the other, th we think those two ingredients, if we can begin building from the ground and begin thinking serious ideas and strategies, get those elements at least discussed, not rhetorically, but practically, a national conversation about this is what we're really trying to do.